moments. How we respond when it dawns on us that we are the most powerful person in the room, the classroom, the boardroom, or even the living room. So if you're a parent, a manager, a teacher, a coach, or really a leader of anything, this episode of Your Move is for you. Stick around. I think that perhaps the um, greatest measure of an individual's maturity, the greatest measure of an individual's maturity, the greatest measurement perhaps uh, of your maturity is how you or how we handle authority, how we handle power, how we handle influence. In other words, how we respond when it dawns on us that we are the most important person or we're the most powerful person in the room, whether it's the boardroom, the classroom, the locker room, whether you're at work, it, it may be at home with your family, but at any moment, at any time when it dawns on you, all eyes are on me, that I'm the one in charge, I get to make the decision, I'm the most powerful person in the room. What you do in that moment says so much about you, and what I do in that moment says so much about me, because the greatest, perhaps, reflection of our individual maturity is what we do with our influence, what we do with power, what we do with authority. And few things are more uh, disturbing, I think you would agree, few things are more disturbing than when you see somebody with power or influence or authority and they leverage it for their benefit to the neglect of the people that they're responsible for, to the neglect of the people that have chosen to follow them. But at the same time, there are few things more inspiring than a leader who has some sort of influence or some sort of authority who says no to herself or no to himself. In other words, they say no to something they could embrace for the sake of the people that they're responsible for, the people that have chosen to follow them. I mean, some of our favorite stories are the men or the women of influence or power, um, whether it's a politician or somebody we've worked for, somebody that we work with, or maybe one of our parents. And they said no to themselves so they, they could say yes to us or yes to the people who've chosen to follow them. Now, my theory is this, that none of us really know, none of us really know which lever we would pull. None of us really know what button we would push until somebody actually hands us the keys, until somebody actually hands us, gives us the position. To sound to the, you know, we won't really know which way we go with this until we actually have the authority, or in David's case, until we get the crown. Now, when David was a little boy, I say a little boy, actually he was in middle school. When David was in middle school, um, Samuel, the prophet, who was kind of the authority other than King Saul, showed up at his home, and he wasn't home that day, he was working. And Samuel, the prophet, showed up in his home, and he said to David's father, Jesse, he said, I'm here on a mission, but um, as we would discover later, it was a secret mission. And the reason it was a secret mission is because Samuel's mission was to anoint the next king of Israel. <laughs> and the reason it was a secret is because Israel already had a what? Yeah, they already had a king. So if you're gonna anoint the next one, there's already one, you better keep your mission a secret. So he shows up and he doesn't even tell Jesse why he's there. He says, Jesse, I've come here to do a special sacrifice. I want you to invite all of your family to this special sacrifice. And the idea was this, that Samuel thought, as soon as I see the son of Jesse, that's gonna be the next king, I'm gonna get the God nod or the nod from God. I'm just gonna know that this is the guy, okay? So um, Jesse invites all of his family to this special sacrifice. And Samuel's kind of you know, scanning the crowd to try to figure out which one of these folks is gonna be the next king? And the text says this, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, which was Jesse's oldest son, which was his firstborn. And you kind of go with the firstborn in a situation like this. And he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. He thought this was easy. Firstborn, first kid. I mean, we don't even have to do the sacrifice, game over. I got this figured out. But you may have remembered this story from childhood. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance which is very difficult to do, right? I mean, when you meet somebody, the first thing you notice is what, you know, not their IQ for sure, right? It's not their manners. First thing you notice is the way a person looks. And all of us, even in ancient times, ascribe value and ascribe sometimes authority and influence to people who look good. And, de and God says, Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. Why? Because the Lord, we learned something important here. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. Yes, they do. Yes, we do. The people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In other words, it's what's in a man that makes a man. So ladies, don't be fooled by that outward appearance, right? And it's what's in a woman that makes the woman. So men, 
never mind, you're hopeless. Anyway, so <laughs> the story goes on. Six, sorry, six, I just wanna keep it real. Six sons later, still no king. I mean, all the sons are there, they're starting to sacrifice and, and Samuel's looking around like, maybe I missed something. And so he finally says to Jesse, imagine this awkward moment. Um, Jesse, are these all the sons you have? I mean, I ask you to invite the whole family, or is this everybody? I mean, what a silly question. I mean, if you ask somebody to invite the family, you know, it's, and, and Jesse looks around, he realizes, oh yeah, no, this isn't everybody. They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him right now. We're not gonna sit down until he arrives. And when David shows up, little you know, shepherd boy David, who's probably 13 or maybe 14 years old, Samuel gets the nod. God says to Samuel, however God said it, he is the one. Then the Lord said, then the Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him, this is the one. And then this strange thing happens where Samuel <laughs> walks over to middle school David and pours oil on his head and gives him a blessing, packs up his stuff and leaves. And the whole family standing there like, what just happened? Because there's no indication that Samuel told Jesse what he anointed David to do. But here's what we know. Since he was a little boy, since he was a middle schooler, David knew God had something special for him. And about 18 months from that moment, or maybe two years later, is when he kills Goliath. He becomes an overnight sensation. And then for the next seven years, things are great. Then as we saw last week, after seven years, David falls out of favor with King Saul. And David becomes a fugitive from the law for eight years. So for the next eight years, David is on the run, hiding with his band of merry men, trying not to side with the Philistines, but at the same time, trying to stay away from King Saul and everyone who supports King Saul. Saul, all the while knowing God had chosen him for something special. And all the while, if you read through this incredible, incredible detailed narrative, all the while learning some extraordinarily important lessons. And perhaps the most important lesson that David learned in the wilderness years was this lesson, that it's not about me. It's not about me. It's God's will, God's way, and God's time. It's God's will and God's way and God's time. It's God's will, God's way, in God's time. And the interesting thing too, and the narrative is so fascinating. On two occasions, David has an opportunity to kill King Saul. One of them is a famous occasion where David is hiding in a cave and King Saul's men are passing by and David's gonna wait for King Saul's men to pass by, then he'll come out of the cave with his men and they'll go in the other direction. And right in front of the, the cave where, King, where David is hiding, King Saul has to go to the bathroom. I think it's one of the only references in the entire Bible to go into the bathroom. Anyway, so Saul has to go to the bathroom. He stops, he gets off his donkey. You, you may know the story. He goes in the cave. David's hiding in the cave with his men. Their eyes have adjusted, Saul's eyes have not. Saul stops in the mouth of the cave, just beyond the point where anybody outside could see and begins to do his business. He is in like the most vulnerable position possible. And all of David's men turn to him and say, and these are my words, not theirs. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? God just delivered your enemy into your hands. In fact, here's what the text says. Then the men with David said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, that I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And David almost falls for this. And you may remember the story, he creeps up on King Saul, he's about to kill King Saul, and, and then you know, walk out of the cave victorious, knowing that everyone in Saul's army would immediately capitulate and declare David king. And as David is about to ki kill King Saul, he realizes, no, 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 I will not take matters into my own hands. Saul finishes, goes, he gets on his donkey, they're about to leave, and David appears in the mouth of the cave. And everybody in Saul's army knows he could have taken the king's life, and he chose not to. But David is a bit mischievous as we're about to find out. And he walks out to the mouth of the cave and he says, yoo-hoo. I don't think that was what he said, but basically he got everybody's attention. And he said, hey, Saul, Saul, and everybody looks and there's David. May the Lord judge between you and me. I'm not gonna be the judge. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you, although everybody behind me and in front of me knows I have every right to take your life, to defend my own. 
Then there's another story that's not so popular. A few months later, um, Saul and his army are in the desert of Ziph. It's just a wide open plain with rolling hills. There, there, virtu there were virtually no trees. And David's men, David had sent spies out to track you know, Saul's progress. The sun goes down. King Saul did what kings always do. He, can't, he put his tent, or he, he decided to spend the night right in the middle of his army. He's completely surrounded by about 3,000 men. His spear is in the ground by his head because that's how they slept. And as the sun went down, as the sun went down, down, David couldn't resist. And he turns to his friend Abishai and he says, Abishai, I have a really bad idea. Would you be willing to join me in my really bad idea? And Abishai says, yes. So here's what happens. So David and Abishai went down into Saul's army at night. They go into the army at night and there was Saul laying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head because that's what they did. Abner, who was the chief of the king's bodyguards, he was the one responsible for protecting King Saul. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him and Abishai said to David, but I think he whispered. So they have now, they have crept past the guards right into the middle of Saul's camp. I mean, what, what were they? thinking. And Abishai whispers into David's ear, God has delivered your enemies into your hands. Now we missed this opportunity once, okay? Now's the time to power up. Now's the time to take what's yours. God wills it. God wills it. God wills it. How else can we explain the fact that we are standing in the middle of King Saul's army and no one has detected us and we are, we are standing next to sleeping King Saul. And then Abishai says, now look, David, I know you got all these religious convictions. You can't lay your hand on the Lord's anointed, but God hasn't told me I can't. Now, let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him one, twice. In other words, David, okay, I know you're, like, you're all freaked out about over the fact that he's the king. Just let me kill him and I won't mangle his body. Imagine it, David. Well, I'll take his spear right through the heart, his eyes are wide open, and the last person he sees in this life is your face. But David whispered to Abishai, but David whispered to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? I refuse, this is so big for us, I refuse to violate the will of God in order to gain the blessing of God and the blessings of God. I will not violate the will of God to gain the promise of God. I'm not gonna violate the will of God to get what I deserve. This is not about me. And the David and his men melt into the desert because David refused. David refused to replace what God had put in place. David refused to replace what God had put in place. Why? God's will, God's way, and God's time. It's gotta be God's will, God's way, and God's time. Well, eventually, I'm skipping a lot. Eventually, King Saul and his son Jonathan are killed by the Philistines in battle. The two men that stood in the way of David becoming the king. And so the tribe of Judah, the, you know, Israel had 12 tribes. The tribe of Judah, which was the tribe David was from, they declare him king. But a fellow named Ishbosheth, who was the, one of King Saul's other sons, he declares himself king. So Ishbosheth, he claims to be king over 11 tribes. David is now king over one tribe. And for seven more long years, there's a conflict between the house of David and the house of King Saul. Then eventually, and throughout this conflict, David essentially just tries to stay out of the way and people continually say to David, claim what is yours, claim what is yours, claim what is yours, and over and over and over, David is no. It's God's will, God's timing, God's way. I will not lay my hand on the Lord's anointed, and if Ishbosheth has been declared king by those 10 or 11 tribes, then he's king. I just need to stay out of his way. Seven years this goes on. And then finally, two brothers sneak into Ishbosheth's house while he's taking a nap, and they murder him in his sleep. And they think they've done a great thing for David because now, think about it, they have removed the last obstacle, the last obstacle to David being able to be king, becoming king over the entire nation of Israel. That last obstacle has been removed. Here's what the text says. It says, they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron, and they said to the king, here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy who tried to kill you. So they present the head, they're so excited, you know, they're elbowing each other in the ribs like this is the day, you know, this is, you know, anyway. And David answered, David answered, Rechab and his brother Baana, as surely as the Lord lives who has delivered me out of every trouble, as surely as the Lord lives who has, as in the Lord has delivered me out of every trouble, 
As surely as the Lord lives, who has taken, who has delivered me out of every trouble, the Lord who didn't need your help and didn't ask for your help. When someone told me that Saul is dead and thought he was bringing me good news, I seized him and put him to death. I skipped that part of the story. That was the reward I gave him for his news. And now they're not so happy. How much more when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house, to which, at which point the people around David are saying, how can you say Ishbosheth is an innocent man? He was claiming the kingdom that belongs to you. But in David's mind, that's not how he thought. It's God's will, God's way, and God's time. How, can, how much more than when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own bed and house on his own bed? So David gave an order and his men, and they killed both of the brothers. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and they buried it, which was a sign of honor. They buried his head in Abner's tomb at Hebron. Well, after Ishbosheth was, was dead, and after um, his demise, the other 11 tribes finally declared for David. And at last, finally, 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 he would become the king of the entire nation. And when all the elders of Israel from all 12 tribes, when all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron to crown him, to hand him the power, in this moment, David shows his true greatness. In this moment, David applies everything he's learned in the wilderness. In this moment, he shows extraordinary maturity, maturity he would not have had at 15 or 20, or as we saw, certainly not at 22. But the difficult lessons he'd learn hiding and running from King Saul, in this moment, he would apply them and he would show his greatness. Think about this. They're about to hand him the power. He's holding all the cards. His word is law. He already has the influence. He's the most powerful person in the room, even without the crown. And in this moment, the text tells us that King David made a covenant with them in Hebrew. Now, a covenant, in our way of thinking, is like a contract. A covenant in this context is, I'll do this if you'll do this, and if you'll do this, I'll do this. It was an arrangement, it was an agreement that King David made promises to the people, and this was completely unnecessary. He did not need to do this. He was now the king, his word was law. So why in the world, after being mistreated all those years, and again, he is facing a group of elders who did not support him when he was on the run. He could have exacted a vengeance on every single one of the elders except for those who were part of the tribe of Judah, but he didn't. Instead, he made a covenant with this people. Why? And the last three words of the text explain it all. And this is the point of this story. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, he made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And in this moment, this is so powerful, in this moment, David recognized in public that he would be a king under authority. In this moment, he submitted himself to God's law, which meant as a leader, he was submitting himself to the people over which he would rule. This was his way of saying, this is his way of saying that I am a king, I am not the king. Because as we said in the first part of this series, with all of David's ups and downs and with all of his flaws, David never confused himself with the king of Israel. And they anointed him king over Israel. And David was 30 years old and he reigned over Israel for 40 years. Now, we're gonna pick the story up right there next week and take it to the end. You're not gonna wanna miss next week. But here's the point, David waited, this is amazing. David waited 15 years for God to give him what he had promised, been promised. That David waited, and not an easy 15 years, David waited 15 years for God to give him what he had promised promised. And during that time, he learned the extraordinary lessons that would make him a good and right king. He learned that leadership is always a stewardship and that even kings are accountable. And while this is very inspiring, I think if you're a leader or if you're a boss, or if you're an aspiring leader, certainly you read this story. And again, I've skipped a lot of details. When you read this story, there's something very inspiring about it. But here's the thing. It is really not enough for us to be inspired Whenever we watch someone do the right thing, as I said up front, whenever we see a leader, whenever we see a leader say no to themselves so they can say yes to the people they're leading, it's always inspiring. But if you're a Jesus follower, if you're, if you're a Christian, it's not enough for us to be inspired. That kind of greatness 
is actually required. And here's why I say that. This is so cool. A thousand years later, imagine that. It's, it's impossible for us to imagine. A thousand years later, 20 miles north of Hebron, 20 miles north of where all this took place, in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus would model this kind of greatness in the most unusual way, but there would be a twist. And here's what happened. John, who was there, who was an eyewitness of all these things, here's what he wrote about this incredible moment when Jesus modeled what David modeled, but Jesus modeled it with a twist. It was just before Passover, and the Passover festival, of course, is when the Jewish people would celebrate annually the moment or the time when God led the nation out of Egyptian slavery. And Jesus, during this Passover, this would be his last Passover with his disciples, he's gathered in what's referred to as the upper room, the special room where they would meet for the Passover meal. And so they're finishing up the Passover meal, and John, who would, uh, you know, John, I'm sure, who would interview all of this detail out of Jesus later, because what happened in this next moment was so fascinating. John, who was there, says this, that somehow Jesus knew in this moment that the hour, had for him, the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus knows that in just a few hours, he's gonna be arrested. He's gonna be tried. He's gonna be crucified. And like David, this is so fascinating, like David, he's been anointed by God, but not recognized. And like David, during this same meal, he would inaugurate a brand new covenant, not between God and the 12 tribes of Israel. He would, he would introduce a brand new covenant. In fact, it's called the new covenant. It's why we call the second half of our English Bibles, the New Testament. He would initiate a brand new covenant between God and all of mankind, but not in the, through the blood of an animal, but through his own blood. And in this moment, this is like the hinge moment in history between the time when he worked and functioned as a Jewish rabbi and miracle worker to the moment when it dawns on him in some crazy, mysterious way that perhaps he didn't know before. We don't know the answers to all that. But John says in this moment, he recognized that the end had come. He recognized that this was a very, very special moment. And here's what John said. Jesus knew, get this. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. In this moment, Jesus has the power without the crown, the authority without the title. He's holding all the cards. He recognizes that God has put all things under his authority. And the text tells us, John tells us, so he got up. And here's the question. What do you do when you're king? What, what do you do when you're the most powerful, influential person in the room? What do you do when you've got the whole world in your hands? And John says he got up. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist and the disciples just, they, they just, they couldn't believe it. There is so much emotion in this room. There's like, there's like a moan, there's a groan. In fact, Peter's gonna say, no, 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 you're not doing that. We have people for that. We have slaves for that. We have servants for that. Put your clothes back on. You are not about to do what it looks like you're about to do. You are not about to wash our feet. You're a rabbi, you're our teacher. Besides, we've seen what you can do with those hands and you're not about to use those hands to wash our feet. Jesus just smiled, ignored all of them. And after that, he poured water, the text tells us, into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And then he put on his robe that showed, yes, he was a rabbi, that yes, he had authority. And he sat down and I think he had a grin on his face and I think there was nobody said a word because he didn't need to say anything. He had just preached the most powerful lesson that he would preach to that group of people. He had just done something that was so obvious what he meant by what he did that he didn't need to say anything, but he did say something. And maybe he said it for my benefit. Maybe he said it for your benefit, but they knew. He said, now, now, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. If I am not too good to wash your feet, you are not too good to wash one another's feet. So guys, he would say, and I think to me, he says, and I, th I think if you're a Jesus follower to you, he says, in those moments when you think you're something, in those moments when you think you're somebody, 
When someone hands you the keys, when they show you to the corner office, when you get the opportunity of a lifetime, when they set on your head the crown, in that moment, look for more feet to wash. Because, because perhaps the greatest reflection of our maturity, perhaps the thing that says more about our maturity than anything else, is what we do when we have authority, when we have power, when we have influence. Perhaps the thing that says more about you than anything else can be said about you is what you do when it dawns on you that you have the power, that you have the authority, that you have the influence. How we respond when it dawns on us that we are the most powerful person in the room, the locker room, the classroom, the boardroom, any room. And let's be honest, all right? For many of us, maybe for most of us, let's be honest. At some level, in some capacity, somebody's already handed us the keys, haven't they? Because you've got a title. For somebody, you wear a crown. You're a father, you're a mother, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're a manager, you're an owner, you're a captain of the team. Maybe you're just the big brother, you're the big sister, you're the president, you're a board member, you're a scheduler, you're an admin assistant, but you have authority. And we would do well to embrace the greatness that David learned the hard way and that Jesus modeled for us. That when you are the most powerful person in the room, you leverage your power for the benefit of the other people in the room. That when you're the most powerful person in the room, when you're the most powerful person in the relationship, you leverage your power for the benefit of the other people in the relationship. This is what David learned in the desert. This is what Jesus modeled for us. And if you are a Christian, this is required of you as it is required of me. Because after all, after all, even the Son of Man, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Imagine if all of us with influence led that way. Imagine if all of us lived that way. History tells us that that kind of selflessness changed the world once, and perhaps it would again. When it dawns on you that you've got the power, that you've got the authority, that you've got the influence, look for a way to wash more feet. Look for a way to leverage that power, that authority, that influence for the benefit of the other people in the room. That's what your Savior did for you, for me. Hey, as always, thank you so 